Simon Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who have received a faith the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ, grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of the Lord Jesus seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises in order that by them we might become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence to your faith, supply moral excellence, and to your moral excellence, knowledge, and to your knowledge, self-control, and in your self-control, perseverance, and in your perseverance, godliness, and in your godliness, brotherly kindness, and in your brotherly kindness, Christian love. For these are the qualities, if if these qualities are yours in increasing, um, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful, in the true knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to point out a theme that you're going to catch over and over in um, this book of 2 Peter, and that is the knowledge of God, having a knowledge of God. Look at verse uh, 2 again. Grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of our Lord Jesus Christ. And then look with me... um, In verse 3, to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who calls you. And then look down in verse 8, through the true knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What we're going to see here is that Peter is ready to check out. He knows he's going to tell us later on in this chapter that his time is coming where he's going to leave his body behind and go to be with the Lord. And if you're knowing that your time is coming and you know that things are happening in the church and you know that you have one last chance to write something, what would you write? How would you approach this group of people with what's really important? What last message would you give to impact a group of people on destiny and following the Lord Jesus? Well, we're going to get this picture that Peter is going to just Give to this group of people who are facing persecution. We're going to see that there is going to be false teaching creeping in. And so the the, the combative thing of this false teaching will be the knowledge of the truth. We're going to see about end times and how end times affects the way that we live our life today. And how the knowledge of the truth gives us perspective to live out our life in this world. But the first thing that Peter talks about, about the knowledge of Jesus Christ, is the saving knowledge. The knowledge that we have a gift from heaven that we did not earn. It's a gift. Look at verse 1. Simon, Peter, a bondservant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. There was one time when Peter kind of wanted to be the head guy. Lord, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? And they were kind of vying and fighting for who got to sit on the right-hand side and who got to sit on the left. And Peter was in that kind of discussion. Who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? Now his attitude has changed. How does he look at himself? What is the knowledge that you have about yourself? How do you view yourself? Notice what Peter is saying. He's not trying to be more than... um, He's not trying to be what his ego is telling him to be. He's not trying to be more than God wants him to be. He calls himself Peter a bondservant. A bondservant is one who would serve as a slave. His time would come. He would be then released, but choose to stay on instead of leave. That's a bondservant. And the master would take um, uh, an anvil and drive a hole in his ear as a ring that, that would be much like our wedding band that says this person has chosen to stay on. Even though they are free not to, they have chosen to stay on. And Peter went through that time when he denied the Lord. He was sifted as wheat. And Jesus had even said, you know, Peter, after you deny me, after you fail and you come back to me, I want you then to strengthen and feed the sheep. Your calling is so that it is in me 
And it's through the knowledge of who you are in me that will make you a better shepherd. And after you fail, you're going to have more compassion. You're going to be a better shepherd. You're going to choose to follow me. Once again, I don't know about you, but I remember as a young Christian, I kind of had times where I wanted to backslide. And uh, are you like me? I, it's almost like coming to faith in Christ. Well, I hope you're not like me. But when you come to faith in Christ, there's this kind of exuberant knowledge. Your eyes are open. Your blinders are ripped off. And the love of God is so sweet when somebody comes in repentance and gives their life and surrenders it uh, to the King of Kings. And that sweetness is kind of gone throughout the years of the, of the brightness of having your blinders ripped off. And you kind of want to backslide so you can come back. And I was stupid, I know. But I always had that, I want to get back to my first love, I think is what it was, really. And here is Peter. He got that chance where he did fall, he did fail, he did deny the Lord. And he beat himself up. And he didn't feel worthy to be the Lord's. And he denied the Lord, and the Lord reestablished his call and said, Peter, do you like me more than the fish, the fishing business? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. And so it was in a sense that Peter knows what a bondservant is, is because he left the master and he came back and he chose Jesus again after his failure. And so he sees himself the knowledge of who you are in Christ. He sees himself as a bondservant and as an apostle, a sent out messenger from the Lord Jesus Christ, who has a sense of authority to walk in, to equip people and feed the sheep. It wasn't Peter's idea to be an apostle. It was the Lord's who had called him. He gave him the keys and said, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loosed on earth will be loosed in heaven. And he had this sort of apostolic authority, and it was out of who God had called and made him to be. And so he steps into that role. He's writing people in these churches that really Paul started. Paul is probably off the scene in Spain. Peter is uh, just ready to know that he's going to be martyred. He has a feeling about it, a revelation from heaven. He talks about that in this chapter. And so he's writing and he's stepping into that role that God has called him into. And I, I don't know about you. But when God called me to the ministry, I told my parents, and they said, are you sure? And uh, if you'd heard me try to teach the first few times, you'd say, are you sure? And, but I believe that God, I believe more what God said than how I felt or what other people thought. And I kept persisting and kept pressing through. And, and I believe there is that kind of testing that each and every one of us must go through. You must go through, who are you in Jesus? What is the knowledge of Christ to you? Who are you in Christ? Yes, you're a bondservant, but who are you that God is calling you into to step into this new thing? And it's not your idea. It's not someone else's idea. Calling for me doesn't really go very far. Calling from your parents or ideas from other Christians that influence you, they don't go that far. But when you step into the knowledge of who God is calling you to be, as Peter did, suddenly you find yourselves not being uh, unfruitful, but fruitful. You produce something. And so he looks at himself. He looks at Jesus. He said, I'm a bondservant of Jesus Christ. I'm not trying to be more than what God wants me to be. And I don't want to be less, and I don't want to have this false humility about it, you know? It's like... You go up to someone and say, well, man, that really hit home. That really ministered to me. It's, oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. It's a kind of a false humility. But walking in the knowledge of who God is calling you to be. He received a faith. And now he understands that he together collectively is joined by God to those who received a faith of like faith. There is a sense where we are gathered together as a group of people we believe what God is saying to us as a body of people, and we have a like faith. And therefore, God has put us together to make us into a city on a hill, a light that shines into the darkness. And he, God, builds people, called out, ecclesia, called out groups of people to do things for his kingdom. And when we step into that calling, when we step into that knowledge of who God is making us to be, then suddenly we bear fruit. 
and our fruit remains. And that's where Peter's coming from. He said, we are, I'm a bondservant, I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. Um, to all of those who have received a faith, the same kind as ours, by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Paul is, or Peter is telling Paul's group here, he's saying, look, the way that you are in your faith now and the way that you have answered the call of God is because of you have received a faith. You've received something. I tell people that don't know Jesus and they're trying to clean up their lives. They're trying to be better people so that God will accept them. Give it up because faith is a gift. And that's what Peter is saying. It's a gift of righteousness, not our own righteousness, but a righteousness that comes from God, our Savior. And he's telling these folks, he says, look, if you have a knowledge about this, it will set you free. Listen, if you have a knowledge that this was not your idea, that God called you, that he brought you into his family, that he loves you, that he died for you. It's a gift. And, and suddenly your unrighteousness is paid for on the cross and God's righteousness is given to you or added to your account. It's imputed to your account. Once you understand that, that you are not a believer, you're not put in this body of Christ, you're not going to heaven because of your own righteousness, but it is a gift. A gift that you must receive, not that you work for, not that you prove yourself for, but it's a gift from God, and it's a gift of righteousness. It's not your own, but it's His. And when you walk in the knowledge of the gift of righteousness, you, you begin to say, you know, I'm not that much. Self, I'm nothing. Apart from Him, I can do nothing. But when He and I abide together, we bear much fruit. And I think Peter's got a, a holistic view of of who God is and who he is in God and who these people that he's writing to are. People that God chose. I don't know about you, but when you go to church and you hear all these things, this is what you ought to do and you ought to and you ought to and this is your response and you ought to and there are those things in the Bible. But should you ever go through the Bible, you begin to see that there is a flow and this is the same flow in chapter 1 that Ephesians gives us in the first three chapters. There's no, there's no call for the believers to do anything. It's all what God has done for them. He chose you before the foundation of the world. He, he appointed you to be an heir. He, he sealed you with the Holy Spirit. You know, you are to the praise of his glory and on and on and on and all that God has done. You were in darkness and he made you alive together. You were, you were dying and walking according to the course of the world and he made you alive together. And all that God has done, and then you look at your response and it's so minuscule compared to God's um, working. And here we have it again. The knowledge of the gift from heaven. How much does God want this for you? Are you secure in God calling you? Are you secure in God making you his child? If that's the case, then suddenly your response is going to come uh, to you and it's going to be a blessing to you to respond to that calling. And so we have this knowledge, the knowledge of the experience of a gift of righteousness that we've received. We have a knowledge of God's power. Look at verse 3. Well, we have grace and peace that's multiplied to us. I guess if you're, if you're going to pay with your life and be a martyr, you know, as some of these people would become with the persecution that Nero was handing down, I guess it would be good to walk in a sense of peace <laughs> and a sense of grace. Well, grace is suddenly exploding. It's God's unmerited favor. It's, it's what you don't deserve that you get from God. Grace is so important. Do you understand this? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. You get pulled over, you're speeding. I always tell the policemen when they pull me over, uh, I don't know all of them by name yet, but uh, <laughs> when they pull me over, I, you know, I, realize, I realize that they have authority to, to write a ticket. And I, I, I usually confess my guilt and say, you know, I'm wrong. I've blown it, you know. I don't want to argue with them. Um, and and I, I know that 
you have the power to extend mercy to me right now. You don't have to write me a ticket. You have the power to extend mercy. I know I deserve it, but you see, mercy is not getting what you deserve. That's mercy. Grace is getting what you don't deserve. The goodness of God, the favor of God, the blessings of God. That's different than mercy, do you see? So when he's saying grace and mercy be multiplied to you through the knowledge of Jesus. Do you know Jesus? Do you understand grace that God wants to give you things and he doesn't like withhold and kind of scorn at you and say, you know what? I really don't want to give you that because you don't deserve it. It's like that's how I am, but that's not how God is. And God's calling me more to be like him. And he, he, he gives us peace, and he gives us this mercy, and it's multiplied to me. Peace is multiplied to me. Grace is multiplied to me. And I know I don't deserve it, but I say, bring it. I know I don't deserve it. And I'm not going to let my lack of deserving it prevent you from giving it to me so that you can be glorified. And, that, and that's a wonderful place to live with God. It's through the knowledge of him to have this grace and peace be exploding upon your life. Now, look at what he says in verse 3, because we're looking at the knowledge of God's power is for what? Verse 3, seeing that his divine power has granted to us. Do you know where God's power is focused? To you. God's power. It's focused. It's aimed. It's pointing. You're in the sights of God's power. Do you know that? God's power is focused on you. Look at this. Oh, it's so much of a blessing that seeing, with knowledge you get to see things, seeing his divine power has granted to us Everything, not some things, everything pertaining to life and godliness. Are you having a hard time being godly? Are you having a hard time living life like you should? Have an understanding of the knowledge of God's power focused on you. You're in his sights. His power is pointing to you. Watch this. This is so good. Everything pertaining to life and to godliness. And then number four, verse four, we have this knowledge of a promise. But first of all, let's go back. I'm sorry. Verse three, everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him. There's false knowledge of Jesus. Do you know this? There are people who create Jesus into their own image, and they make Jesus into something that is acceptable to other people. Well, listen, Jesus Christ transcends people shaping and ideas of who he is. And there's a lot of people talking to Jesus' talk that really don't know Jesus. Paul says, I, I point these things out to you with tears in my eyes knowing that they're speaking the name of Jesus, but they're not his. And I, I say that weeping, he says. But here he, he says, he has given us everything pertaining to life and godliness uh, through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. God called you. God's power is pointing to you. God has called you. Just like he called Adam in the garden. After Adam sinned, Adam says, well, I don't deserve God. I will run from him and hide. And what did God do? He sought him out. Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam. And he comes looking for Adam, who is trying to cover his own sin with his own religiousness with fig leaves. And what does God do to Adam when he called him? He showed him what righteousness was. He said, this is a false righteousness. You have to cover your own undone sinfulness. Are you here today and you have a vision of your ungodliness? You have a picture of how unholy you are, but you kind of cloak it in your own thing. Eh, some people cloak it in like, 
Well, I'll go to church, I'll be a member, I'll get baptized and all of these things. I will um, point out to you a hundred people that are worse than me and I will compare myself to worse people so I feel better about myself. And are you hiding behind the cloak of pulling other people down to your level? You know those church people. You ever hear that when you're talking to people about Jesus? It's those church people. You know, and sometimes they have a good point. But sometimes they just don't. And they're weighing themselves against other people, and they don't want to be a part of that hypocritic group over there. And it's like, you don't have to hide behind a religious facade. You don't have to bring other people down to make yourself feel better. You don't have to do that anymore. Because what did Jesus, what did God do? He said, Adam, where are you? He found him, and he says, who told you that you were naked? It's, you know, it's the enemy. And what did Adam do? He blamed his wife. It's the woman you gave me. And really, he blamed God. It's the woman you gave me. But what did God do? He stripped him of his own religious covering of his shame. And he killed an animal. And Adam and Eve had never seen an animal die to that point. There was no such thing as death before this. God killed an animal and took the pelt of an animal, an innocent animal, the shedding of blood of an innocent animal to cover his nakedness. And he said... This is my grace and mercy to you, that there will come one who will die in your place who is righteous to take away your unrighteousness and to add to your righteousness. And he made a promise to Adam and Eve through their seed, through their children, would come down through the family line, the Savior for their sins, the Lamb of God who would take away the sin of the word. Are you here today and you're hiding behind some kind of crappy religiousness? What did Paul call it? He said... The things I used to do that I counted gain, I now count it but loss. He said, religious, I was very religious, but I count all of my religiousness as nothing. He says, I count it as dung, poop, in view of gaining the knowledge of Jesus. The knowledge of Jesus. And so we have here the knowledge of God's <clears throat> promise. We have in verse 4, uh, I have a cold, did you pick that up? For by these <clears throat> he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. That, those are words that I think we use in salesmanship. It's magnificent. It's awesome. It's precious. It's like, oh, come on. When you look at the promises of God, these are words that come to mind. They are precious, they're magnificent promises in order that by them you might become partakers, partakers of the divine nature. Oh my God, the divine nature of God. I am a partaker. I am a partaker of the divine nature. Now, it's not through my own righteousness, just like Paul says in Philippians 3, not through my own righteousness. That's dung. Get rid of it. But through his righteousness, I have become, through his promises, I have become a participant of his divine nature. Now, the knowledge of God's promise comes out twofold. Number one, it comes out in participation and in number two, it comes out in protection. Listen to what it says. Not only am I a participant in the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. There is a participation through the promise, and there is a protection for you through the promise. The participation is you participate in this divine nature. Okay, that's good, isn't it? The protection is you are not only a participant, but having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. You have escaped something that the world cannot escape on its own. It's lust, corruption. How God made you is being corrupted and defiled but through the precious promise, you are a partaker of the divine nature, and now you, are, you have escaped. Um, one of the neat things about um, 
watching, I've, I've seen these things where people or animals are caged up and when they get free, it's just glorious, you know? You've escaped, you've been in bondage, you have been under guilt, you have been under condemnation, you've been corrupted to what God has really made you for, you're corrupted and so far from it, you're an enemy of God even so much so, but now through the divine promise, you're our participant in the divine nature, and you are now escaping the corruption. There is a world that wants to corrupt you. If you don't have Jesus, you will be swept into corruption. If you don't have the divine promise, if you're not living, if, you, if it's not for the promise, you're going to wash out with the world in corruption. The only way to escape the corruption in the world and not being such a jerk and a bad person and a guilty person and a condemnation that's on you, the only way to escape that is through the promise of Jesus. The world cannot offer you this. It's only at Jesus' table of promise. And he promises you this. He said, I'm going to make a promise. Now, do you get the idea? Now, he has not said one word about what we ought to do. It's all what God has done. It's all so far what God has done. He called us. He made us a participant in the divine nature. He gave us his righteousness. That not of ourself. It is a gift of God. He has made us our participant in the divine nature, and we have escaped the corruption that's in the world. Now, here's our part, verse 5. That's God's part. Now, what's our part? Look at verse 5. Now, for this very reason also, applying all diligence in your faith, supply moral excellence, and in your moral excellence, knowledge. And in your knowledge, here's knowledge again. Knowledge is so important. Folks, there's, can I just say something? I, I, I am really, I don't know how to say this. I'm so, I know that when I look back on my life, I've done a lot of dumb things that I wished I would never have done. But there are some things that I know as I look back on my life that I, I have really will be pleased to say I did that right. One of the things I believe out of all the bad things and things I've done wrong, one of the things I tell the guys at Teaching Pool as we meet, there's like nine of us meeting now, is that none of these guys would have taught through Scripture and, and received the Word in its context. You can pull Scriptures out about your part and not even give God's part, or you can give God's part without giving your part, and you can make it so lopsided. But one thing I feel like I've done that I will be pleased, and I think I'm going to hear this from the Lord, and I, I don't, I'm not saying this in a bragging kind of way. It's just that I think that this is where God has led us, teaching through the Bible in the context of what is being written. I feel like this is something I've given to, so far, nine young men who are pastoring, who are teaching through the Bible, and they did not want to do it at the beginning. But now not one of them would do it any different. Going through the scriptures be, creates a knowledge of God. And we see this word knowledge, to your knowledge, add self-control. There's this moral excellence, and there's these chain of things. And if one breaks, it's like it, it starts coming apart. But here's what our part is to this. For this reason, because of the promises, because of the grace that's exploding through the knowledge, because of the righteousness of God, uh, for this reason... For this reason, he says, applying all diligence to your faith. It's good that you have faith because it's, it's through faith that we receive the gift of God and, and, and inherit eternal life. It's through faith. But don't just, don't just get your ticket to heaven punched. Add something to your eternal salvation. Watch this. To your faith, supply moral excellence. Make moral choices that are good. And to your moral excellence, knowledge. Because the more you know, the more you grow. The more you know, the more you grow. And to your knowledge, self-control. And to your self-control, perseverance. How many people are on track to inherit God's promise for your life only to find up, out that you can't persevere when the hard times come, you give up. You quit on the verge of a miracle. And you get to have anything. This is what you could have had, but here's where you stopped and you gave up. So to this, add 
perseverance. Don't give up. To your perseverance, godliness. And to your godliness, brother, kindness. How kind are you to your brothers? How kind are you to your sisters? Are you, do you have truth, but you have truth like a Pharisee and you're not kind to people? Add these things. Let them all come together as a package. Don't select this and let go of that. Add these things. Now, the knowledge that produces growth are these virtues. And they are produced by the fruit of the Spirit. But we must give ourselves to add these things. Your responsibility, therefore, for this reason, applying all diligence. Applying diligence. Add these virtues to your life. Now, the positive side is in verse 5 through 8. Is this, <clears throat> excuse me, for if these qualities in verse 8 are yours and are increasing, they render you neither useless nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. It's one thing to say you know Jesus, but are you fruitful? Are you fruitful and are you useless or useful? Are you fruitful? Are you fruitless? Now, if you add these qualities, you will bear fruit that looks like God, smells like God. His power is pointing at you so that you can produce this fruit. And if you add these things, you will bear fruit. You won't be useless in the knowledge of Jesus. To have the knowledge of Jesus and to be useless and unfruitful is such a tragedy, such a shame. Now, <clears throat> verse 8, or verse um, 9, For he who lacks these qualities is blind or short-sighted, having forgotten his purification from his former sins. Now, this command has a positive and it has a negative. It has a growing fruitfulness for those who apply it, and those who do not apply it, the negative is, you will become spiritually blind. You may be on your way to heaven, but once the eyes of God looks at you with fire and the fire tests your works, not your soul, but your works, there will either be wood, hay, and stubble, and everything will be burned up because you didn't add these things. There's no fruit. There's nothing left. You're saved, though, as by fire, but you could have had all of this magnificent fruit coming forth from your life and the fact that you didn't do that made you spiritually blind. You don't even know. You can't perceive. You can't walk in the light in the knowing kind of way. You're blind spiritually. You just got your ticket punched to heaven and that's all you care about. You're short-sighted. You are blind, Peter says, if you are not having these virtues and growing in this knowledge. So there's a knowledge that's a gift from heaven. There's a knowledge that helps us grow. And then there's a knowledge of revelation verses um, in the next few verses. Therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you. For as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. There's another added blessing. If you're growing in these things, you won't stumble. And your calling and your choosing will be obvious, not only to God and to you, but other people. And he's saying, look, you got your ticket to heaven punch, great. That's your calling. But make sure that other people know that you're called. Make sure that it's evident to you. Make sure it's evident to other people by adding these virtues. Suddenly people say, there's a guy that's got God's hand. There's a woman. She has God's hand on her life. There's something of God working in that person's life that I cannot explain. And it says that, <clears throat> um, that a positive thing is, is that we produce fruit, we're useful, and we make our calling and election sure and certain, and it's expressed to other people. Now, verses 12, uh, I better read 11. For, this <clears throat> for in this way... The entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ will be abundantly supplied to you. Entrance into the kingdom. What is that? 
what is the entrance into God's kingdom? Well, certainly when you are born again, Nicodemus was told by Jesus, he said, unless you're born again, you won't see the kingdom. But then there's entrance into the kingdom. And that's, I think, if I can explain this very briefly, is basically Jesus' baptism. Because when Jesus was baptized, the kingdom exploded, and that was his public um, starting of his public ministry. What happened? Three things. The heavens opened. God's favor gushed from heaven upon Jesus. Number two, the Holy Spirit descended upon him. It's the filling of the Holy Spirit. And number three, the voice from heaven said, this is my son, this is my daughter, I really am pleased with you. I'm pleased, I'm pleased, I'm pleased with you. Do you realize what it would be like to hear those words from God? God is pleased with me. I know there are times when God has given me some kind of prophetic word to speak to someone about his pleasure in them. It's so hard to receive when it's, it's easy to give to other people, but it's hard to receive yourself sometimes, isn't it? It's like, guy, I'm really pleased with you. Wow, Lord, you are? You are? I remember when uh, there's um, a family that came their first week here, and uh, I was sitting in the back. They did not know that I was a pastor. They didn't know who I was. And the Lord spoke to this guy the week he visited before the service during the worship time. And he said, you see that guy over there with his hat on backwards? He goes, yeah. He said, I love that guy. And then he said, when, when, the, when it was time for the message, you got up and you spoke. And I thought, oh my. Before I knew who he was, the Lord said, there's my favor on this person, you know. And I don't say that. I'm not trying to say that in any kind of um, personal kind of, because um, I really feel like God is pleased with you more than you realize. Some of you are not so happy as Christians because you don't feel God's pleasure. You feel like you're still trying to earn his favor. I want to tell you today that my grandkids, they can be nasty at times, but I still feel pleasure toward them. My daughter, same way. How does God see you? Can you feel God's pleasure? If you don't, guess what? You're going to be striving to please him on your own energy. And some of you need to hear this very directly today. The three things that expanded the kingdom of God, that dumped the kingdom on Jesus, that moment was the heavens were open. There was no barrier between God and Jesus. And the, and it was like wherever Jesus walked, the heavens were open and God's grace was just flooding like a shower pouring out over Jesus. And he walked, and wherever he walked, the heavens were opened, and he had God's pleasure. And the Holy Spirit came upon him, and Jesus said, the people that you see healing, the words that you hear teaching, the food that you see multiplied, he said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, and he has anointed me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to captives, to recovery of sight to blind, to proclaim the favorable year of God. God's favor's on you. He said that was done by the Holy Spirit. It wasn't out of so much of his deity, but Jesus walking in the power of the Holy Spirit. And so it is with us. If we want entrance into this kingdom, it is through the open heaven, the filling of the Holy Spirit, and knowing that you are walking in God's pleasure, that he's pleased with you. I have seen children try to please their parents that do not feel that pleasure, and it's a horrible life. I think that, I, I think that many of us need counseling. You and I, we need counseling uh, in the sense of our, who we are in God's eyes. And I don't mean kind of counseling. I mean biblical truth, the knowledge of him. We need to feel like God is Please with me? I need to come to grips with that because if I don't, I'm like a child that's always trying to prove to his father how good he is and never quite feeling accepted. Are you with me? And Jesus, Jesus had that pleasure of God on him, and that's for the joy set before him, but he endured the cross because of this joy that God gave him. Knowing that he had God's pleasure set before him, endured the cross. Now, none of us are perfect, just like, my, 
Just like your children are not perfect, but don't you feel pleasure when you see them? Gosh, I watched um, Maria bring um, the boys in, you know, uh, when Lars is working, and I just watch Lars look at his kids. Those dudes look like you. I told <laughs> Maria, I said, the next kid you have, I hope is a girl with dark hair. Because those boys look just like you. And I just look at Lars, and he smiles at his kids. And I look at the boys, and I smile. And I just think, God, how pleased. What a beautiful little family um, they have. And uh, do you feel God's pleasure like that? I, it, it comes through the knowledge of the truth of Jesus. Are you walking in that kind of knowledge of the open heaven, the filling of the Spirit? And that, that's how the kingdom is exploding. Listen, folks, um, I don't know what's happening, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to tell you something I think is happening, okay? I, I'm going to tell you before it happens. I think God is stirring something crazy up at Ball State University. I don't know. I can't put my finger on it. Except I was praying one time and got this picture three years ago, and I, I haven't been able to let go. I've been walking on campus and praying on campus a little bit. And I found out, do we have any students here this morning that are in the Taylor prayer meeting? Um, yeah, look at these. And I, how, many camp, how many campuses are gathering? Five campuses gathering, and you're, is this, tell me if I'm wrong, please, I don't want to misrepresent you. Is it five campuses are praying together for God's kingdom? And I just think God wants to do something, and, and I think it's, he wants to do something on campuses. A lot of movements started on campuses. Did you know this? Um, Andrew Draper speaking at Taylor Monday. He's one of our site pastors at Urban Light, but... Um, I don't know what God is doing, but God is calling people together to prayer because the kingdom is, the Lord wants to come more than we want him to come. And uh, we, we were talking about this in intern class, and one of our new interns, Travis, said, why don't we move our class from the church over, because you're going to teach on spiritual gifts. Why don't we have Tuesday classes on campus? And so we're, gonna, we're a student organization at Ball State, and uh, we're going to, we can get rooms free. Did you know this? And so we're going to get a room, and we're going to start teaching at Ball State on how to hear God and how to evangelize and different things. And so I'm so excited. I don't know, but I feel like God has got something up. And what I feel is like the kingdom is wanting to come. And I must believe and walk in the assurance that God wants this more than I do and that he's got to change me and get me ready. And he's, that's usually where it starts is in prayer. He changes us, right? And so I would like to hear more, and, and I would like to hear, uh, next week I'll be here, but uh, I would like to hear a report from this prayer group. I, I would like to hear more about that. Um, so let's talk. How many of you are here um, who are students at Ball State? Can I see your hands? Okay. How many of you are here from Anderson University? Can I see your hands? Okay, yes. How many of you are here from Taylor University? Can I see your hands? Okay. Um, Indiana Wesleyan. Yes, okay. Wow, this is cool, isn't it? I just want to announce to you, I think God's up to something. I hear the heavens, I hear the roar, the sound of a distant roar, and I think God wants to come to Ball State. I, I don't know how it's going to happen, but I'm so pleased to announce it before it happens. I just sense something. Uh, I've missed God before, but the spider web and the, and the stack deck were okay. I can't hear him sometimes. And so I, I'm just announcing something that I think is in the kingdom coming to us in, uh, in Muncie. So I don't know what to do. I, I want to I plug in and partner with God uh, in this situation. Now, um, cl in closing, verse 12, Therefore, I shall always be ready to remind you of these things, even though you already know them. It's just like a mother. Drive carefully. <laughs> um, eat your vegetables you know this is good for you uh, let me remind you you already know let me remind you and uh, I think it's kind of nagging but uh, Peter is under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit so I won't say that really about him uh, he said 
And I consider it right as long as I am in this earthly dwelling to stir you up by way of reminder, knowing that laying aside of my earthly dwelling is imminent, as also the Lord Jesus has made known to me. What's, what's Peter saying? I know that my body, this tent, is going to be torn down, folded up, and I'm going to have a new body from heaven. I know that my time on earth is coming to an end. Knowledge. Sometimes God gives us knowledge of things yet to come. I'm teaching a course on pneumatology, which is pneuma meaning the breath of God, the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the courses we're going to teach at Ball State when we get our room, is the work of the Holy Spirit. And he says he will remind you of things and teach you of things yet to come. To come. The Holy Spirit can give you glimpses, peaks over the edge. God is coming to Ball State. He's speaking of things to come. It's the prophetic kind of view of seeing things yet to come. Peter sees what? I'm going to die soon. I'm going to fold this body up. And in my last breath, I'm going to remind you of these things. So listen closely. Have you ever been to the bedside or have you ever talked to someone that's so close to death? Maybe they're on their deathbed and they say they are trying to tell you something and you can't hear, so you put your ear right down by their lips. And they're trying to tell you something like I am today. And you put your ear down and you know that there's something significant of all of their life in perspective. Their last words are these. They must be important. So you listen. Peter's saying, you know, these are some of my last words to you. Listen closely. Listen closely. God is telling me that I'm about to check out of this life into eternal life, 12 through 14. And then 16 through 18 is God is revealing himself on the mountain of transfiguration where it says, and I will also be diligent that at any time after my departure, you will be able to call these things to your remembrance, to mind. For we do not follow cleverly devised tales when we make known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we are eyewitnesses of his majesty. Majesty, that is an incredible word. What is majesty? Well, let's see what Peter says happened that showed him God's power and God's majesty. For we received honor, for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, such as an utterance as was made to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, whom I am well pleased. And we ourselves heard this utterance made known from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Now Jesus took Peter, James, and John to the mountain. And it says that he was transfigured before them. Transfigured means his glory leaked out and he shone. (laughs) Remember Moses coming down from the mountain? What happened? He got the Ten Commandments. He was in the presence of God for 40 days and 40 nights. And he came down from the mountain and his face glowed. He had to cover his face because it was glowing. Uh, Wow. Peter was there on the mountain when Jesus' glory started leaking out. And his clothes shined and his glory just started coming out of Jesus. And he heard the words, this is my son. What was Peter's response? Hey, let's build three tabernacles. You know? And... It disappeared, the glory disappeared, and the voice said, this is my son, listen to him. (laughs) Listen to him. Folks, there's no other way between God. There's going to be people coming in the end times that are going to be so pulling people away from the truth that Peter says, I want you to walk in the knowledge. We didn't follow a clever device plan. We were on the mountain when Jesus was transformed and he spoke these words to us. So we have the revelation that Peter had about his own timetable that he's about to die. We have the revelation that he got on the mountain. And last of all, the revelation from the prophets. 
And verse 19, and so we also have the prophetic word made more sure to which you do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in dark places until the day dawns and the morning star arises in our hearts. But know this first of all, that no prophecy or scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Folks, there is a time when we really need to hear God. And he's given us his word. It's a prophetic word to us. We also need the prophetic word in our own generation. Men speaking not their own ideas, but speaking, as it were, the utterances of God. Because that's what's going to change us. Amen? Next week, I want these people from this prayer meeting. I want to, delegate, I want to meet with you. I want you to share to next Sunday, if you would. Can you do that? I want to jump in on this. I'm going to be in Iraq, and I'm going to get my perspective enhanced. And I just think God's doing a lot of neat things in his timing. I'm going to ask the worship band to come. Um, he's going to do a lot of neat things in his timing that I'm so excited about. Folks, the world deserves, listen to me, the world deserves to see Jesus in his power, not an anemic church. And I, I believe that God wants to empower his church. And I believe God wants to fill us with his spirit. And he wants the kingdom to explode around us. And uh, we must be submissive to him. We, knowing all that he's done, we just want to walk in the knowledge of what he's done. And the knowledge of who he is. And live that out the rest of our days. Shall we stand together and close with a closing song? We're going to switch things up here so we're kind of... Your love, O oh Lord, reaches to the heaven. Your faithfulness stretches to
reaches to the heavens in your faithfulness stretches to the sky someone got this word I believe it's from the Lord he said I saw a curtain call at the end of a play which God wrote for our time God wrote a play for our time and I saw a curtain call and it was our time in history and as each person um, bowed Jesus received glory and honor but there were some waiting in the wings that never took their place they never took their place in history And they're part of the play of God's story. I know I don't have to trump up anything. If it's God's word, he's touching your heart. If it's him, you hear his call. You may need to respond today. Maybe you need to learn to bow and give him the glory. Maybe you need to take your part. You're waiting for somebody that you think is more qualified. You don't see yourself the way God sees you, and you need to see that. And we're going to lay hands on some people this morning. We're going to pray over them to see themselves the way God sees them. That a divine revelation. Paul says, I pray for a spirit of revelation to come, that you might see yourself as God sees you, and you might act according to the call of God, not your own perspective. So, if this is speaking to your heart, um, come and take your place. Come and bow. Come and take your place in world history to follow that call in your life, okay? Let's sing that once more, and we're just going to invite you to come if you'd like prayer.